15, 26 through 32. And the word of the Lord today reads from the King James text. Now his elder son was in the field. And as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he, meaning the servant, said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he, meaning the older brother, was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid, that I might make merry with my friends, but as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, the father that is, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. Amen. I want to talk to us today for a while on the topic, what do you know about it? Amen. Will you bow your heads with me one more time? Father, one more time, Lord, we bow our heads before you and we humble ourselves in your presence. Jesus, we need the anointing of the Holy Ghost in our world and in the church today like we have never before needed the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Lord, you've shown me in the Spirit how that the Spirit of Antichrist has crept into the church and how that it has led the majority, not a large number, but a majority of God's people astray. The spirit of Antichrist, the spirit of lying, the spirit of greed, the spirit of selfishness. All these things have become part and parcel in the Christian church today. And Lord, if we as lovers of truth are going to have any impact on this city and on the world in which we live. We desperately need the anointing of the Holy Ghost to reside upon us. For Lord, it is the anointing of the Holy Ghost that convinces the unbeliever of his need or her need to believe God and to embrace this gospel. It is the anointing of the Holy Ghost that speaks to the heart of believers and confirms in their heart and in their hearing that what they are hearing is in fact a word from God and not a word that would lead them astray or lead them wrong or poison their soul. Master, today anoint your speaker. Oh, anoint me, God, like you've never before anointed me. Anoint today, God, every hearer, those that are in this room, those who are listening by reason of the Internet, those who will later listen. Oh, God, open our ears. I rebuke today, God, the spirit of Antichrist. And I rebuke today, God, every unclean spirit that would rise up in opposition to the truth of God that is able to liberate men's souls. Master, today, speak to our hearts, not just our hearing. Change us, challenge us, raise us up together with you in heavenly places. 
For we ask it in Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. The primary text that I've read to you today comes from the story of the prodigal son. We've all, we're mostly familiar with the story of the prodigal son. A certain man, Jesus said, had two sons. His younger son decided he wanted his inheritance now. And he took his inheritance and he went out in the world and he blew it. It doesn't take long. It's amazing how fast you can blow through some money, you know. It is amazing how fast. That's one reason why there's really wisdom in waiting on your inheritance. See, if you wait till daddy dies to get your inheritance, hopefully you will have aged and grown in wisdom enough that by the time you get your inheritance, you'll have enough wisdom to know how to use it properly. And I tell the truth. Right. Oh, but this kid, you know, like so many young people, oh, I don't want to wait, I want it now. Oh, I want to tell you, there's a lot of people in the church today, I don't want to wait for God to bless me later. I don't want to wait for God to uh, prosper me later. I want it now, I want it now, I want it now. There's an ad on TV. I'm always teasing Tommy. I said, there's your theme song. This ad on TV said, I want it all, and I want it now. Now, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be honest. I'm just teasing Tommy when I say that because my booby does not have that spirit, and he does not have that attitude. And if he did, we wouldn't be together because I don't have time for that foolishness. See, faith knows that even when God's timing isn't our timing, it's better timing. Faith knows that even when the way God's doing things isn't the way that we prefer He did them, that it's probably still the better way to do it. Am I telling the truth today? Amen. Faith knows that God is aware of circumstances and situations that we know nothing about coming down the road. The Bible said He knows the end from the beginning. God knows things. The Lord knows today what would happen, for instance, if someone were to assassinate, let's say, Donald Trump. God knows what would happen if that were to transpire. And what would happen may not be good at all. It may, some people are thinking, yeah, when that happened, all our problems would be solved. And God says, oh, no, they wouldn't. Honey, no, no, no. You think your problems would be solved. I got news for you. It'd get a whole lot worse, a whole lot faster if that were to happen. Even though you and I can't see that, even though you and I don't understand that, because we don't have all the facts. We don't have all the knowledge. Sorry about that. Bill, I'm trying to baptize you in Episcopal fashion here. <laughs> we don't know everything, but God does. And He knows there are times when we have to learn to defer to God's greater wisdom. I remember when I was a young preacher, bless God, I thought I knew everything there was to know. Man, I mean to tell you, I was, oh, I was gung-ho. I wanted Brother Gillum to get behind me and help me preach in every church that I could possibly preach in. And guess what? He didn't. I was so mad. Why won't Brother Gillum get behind me and help me preach? And, you know, why didn't he make a few phone calls for me and, 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 and help me to make some appointments to preach? And Brother Gillum said, Chuck, you need to let God do it. You need to let the Lord open the doors. You need to let the Lord be the one who orchestrates instead of looking for me or anyone else to do it. He didn't say it in those words, but that's basically what he was saying. And I was hot as a hornet. Yeah, Brother Gillum, bless God, he'll get behind his grandson. He'll support this one. He'll support that. He'll help that one to get pointless. He'll help that one. Well, of course, those guys also had, had already kind of established themselves. So, you know, they weren't a hard sell because everybody knew them, you know. God opened doors for me. 
The Lord opened a lot of doors for me. I preached all over. I preached all over the place. I preached in black churches. I preached in Hispanic churches. I've preached in more non-white churches than any white preacher I know. Seriously. At one point, my overseer in the Church of God said, Brother, you better quit preaching in all them black and Hispanic churches because if you keep doing that, you know, they're not going to know who you are in the white churches. And your ministry not going to go anywhere because you're preaching in all these little uh, black and Hispanic churches. I said, brother, when God called me to preach, God told me to preach wherever the door opened. I said, if a black preacher calls me and invites me, I'm going. If a Hispanic preacher calls me and invites me, I'm going. If a black preacher calls me to preach on the 1st of September, and two weeks later a white church calls me and asks me to come preach on the 1st of September, I'm going to go where I first made my commitment. I'm not going to make any kind of changes based on race in an effort to make my ministry more successful, in order to make myself more popular in certain circles. See, I'm going to tell you folks, you'd be surprised the racism, the prejudice that goes on even in churches, even in denominations. And my overseer, I'm going to be honest with you, he, he was not by any means trying to be racist. He really was. He was a good man. But he just, you know, he felt like, in a sense, that, you know, I was limiting my ministry, you know, by preaching so often in these other churches. Well, I just preached wherever God opened the door because that's what God called me to do. We got people in the church today who are so spiritually immature and so childish and fleshly and carnal in their thinking that they want God to give them everything and they want God to give them everything now. And you know what happens when they get it? They blow through it in a matter of weeks. Mm -hmm. They get out in the world, next thing you know, they're backslid. All of a sudden, now, you wouldn't think getting a whole bunch of good stuff would lead to your destruction, would you? Yeah, you would think. You wouldn't think so. How many people have won the lottery and they won millions and millions of dollars and oh man, for a year or two they were living high on the hog and everything was going well and then all of a sudden, Tommy, we see them on the news declaring bankruptcy, their cars being taken away, their houses being boarded up. Hello now. They lose everything. They went from living in a simple little house and having a car that at least was paid off to suddenly being homeless and broke. But what led to that homelessness? What led to them being broke? Oh, well, it was this humongous outpouring of prosperity and wealth all of a sudden. Well, now, how in the world do you take that route? How do you take a route from your needs being met to having way more than you could ever need to all of a sudden not even having enough to meet your needs? Yeah. How does that happen? Well, I'll tell you how it happens. It happens when people who aren't mature enough to handle all that God has for them, but they insist upon getting it out of due season. Am I telling the truth? The prodigal son went out. He blew all his living. The Bible said on whores and on partying and Oh, preacher, you're not supposed to talk like that. Well, you understood what I meant when I said it, didn't you? Yeah, right. I could stand here and twist words and play games all day and all night, but I don't play that. I want you to know what I'm talking about. He went out partying and probably drugged it up. Oh, he probably was buying rounds for all his friends at the bar. I'm going to tell you how many of us know how quickly you can go broke buying rounds for everybody at the bar. And then when you need to move or you need a friend to help you, how many of those bar friends you bought rounds for are volunteering to come help you? When you need a place to stay, how many of those bar friends you bought rounds for are offering you a place to stay? Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. 
when you're hungry. Hey, let's put it down to the lower level when you're hungry and you haven't got money to eat. How many of those bar friends are willing to reach into their pocket and pull out a tenner to help you get a meal at KFC when all they have to do is pull out a buck because you're in a 50 cent beer bash. Oh my goodness. Oh, they don't mind spending 50 cent or a dollar on you. Well, but honey, don't expect them to cough up money for you to get a sandwich. Don't expect them to cough up money for you to eat a meal. Am I telling the truth? Right. One of the things that always amazed me you can get a beggar on the street standing there begging for money, begging for money, begging for money, and people will pass them, and people will pass them, people will pass them. Let that same beggar see a guy coming by him with a cigarette in his mouth. And let that same guy say to the smoker, Hey, bud, can you spare a cigarette? And see how quick the smoker will cough up a cigarette. You ever notice that? See, we're always happy to help people do the dirty stuff. We're always happy to help people do the stuff that they ought not to be doing anyway. The guy's hungry. I won't give him money to eat, but I'll sure enough give him a cigarette. Might as well help him kill himself. Do you hear what I'm telling you? This young man had literally spent all that he had been given and brought himself to the brink of disaster and death. And finally he came to his senses and said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, in my father's house, woo, there's a lot of good stuff in that phrase right there. I could preach a whole message on that phrase right there. He said, in my father's house. You, know, you want to know what I love about that phrase? I love the fact, Johnny, that he understood my daddy is still my daddy. Hallelujah. LGBT person, you may be backslid. You may be away from God. You may be out of church. You may be doing things you never dreamed you'd be doing. But honey, God is still your God. He's still your father. Your father's house is still your father's house. It ain't a stranger's house. It's your father's house. Amen. Amen. And if you'll make your way home, you'll find out daddy is sitting on the porch praying for you and waiting for you. The Bible said the prayers that get answered are those that are prayed with expectation. See, if you pray and you just say, well, Lord, you know, Lord, please do this and so, but you're not expecting it to happen, then you might as well just be talking to the wall. You're not exercising faith. You're not putting faith into your words. You're just talking and beating the air. No, the Word of God said, if you don't pray with expectation, then you're not going to get what you're asking God for. So I imagine that that father was sitting on the porch day after day, week after week. Oh God, send my son home to me. Lord, I'm looking for him to come home. <laughs> I'm looking for him. Lord, I'm sitting here waiting. God, please send my son home. Daddy could have been in the house somewhere. He could have been doing something else. Oh, ooh, I'm going to get Pentecostal today for sure. But glory, if I'm going to pray, I might as well expect. Hallelujah. If I'm going to expect, I might as well be looking. Like the old song said, the answer's on the way. This I know. Jesus said it, I believe it, and it's so. Our Heavenly Father knows what we need before we pray. And you can rest assured the answer's on the way. Amen. I'm going to tell you a little secret. Every time I go to the doctor, I'm waiting. One of these days, I'm just waiting. <laughs> God's done it for me so many times. I keep waiting for the doctor to say, I can't find that leukemia. The leukemia is gone. You think I'm kidding? Just watch and see what happens. 
every time I come to church, I'm expecting the place to be full. Literally. That's one of the reasons why I get so discouraged. If I would just lower my expectations, then all I'd expect is what we got. But Bill, I don't come to church expecting what we got. I come to church expecting more because I'm asking God to send us people who have a mind to do a work for God. People who want to live for the Lord. People who want to work for the Lord. People who want to worship the Lord. That father was sitting on the porch when his son showed up. They didn't have a, you didn't have a servant running the house to find daddy. Daddy was already sitting on the patio looking for the son. Am I telling the truth? He met him halfway down the driveway, Bill. And walked him into the house and he ordered a celebration. He called his friends and said, everybody, come on in, we're going to party tonight. My son's home. Well, the older son wasn't too thrilled about the idea of a party going on for a kid who had taken his share of the inheritance and blown it when the whole time he'd been in the house living right and doing right. I sometimes watch people singing some great gospel music that I know have been born and raised in the church. They've never been out in the secular world. They've never really known or they've never really experienced sin, <coughs> deprivation, failure. I wonder to myself sometimes, what do you know about it? Watch somebody. I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. Then a little light from heaven filled my soul, paid my heart in love, and it broke my name above. Just a little talk with Jesus made me whole. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. And I look at these people up there singing their special, and they're singing these songs, and they're talking about how they were once lost and said, No, you weren't. You were born and raised in the church. You ain't never even been in a nightclub. You ain't never one time put a beer to your lips. You don't know what it is to be drunk. You don't know, oh, I'm going to say some stuff, because I want people to understand what this preacher is talking about. You ain't never woke up next to some stranger, looked at him and said, my God, what in the world was wrong with me last night that I was willing to come home with this beast? You know why you heard a chuckle if you're watching online? Because everybody in here knows exactly what I'm talking about. It's pretty sad when you're so lonely. It's pretty sad when you're so horned up. Because I've got news for you, folks. Don't confuse loneliness with being horny. Is it okay I said that? I'm sure Sister High here holding this is swallowing her dentures because after all, the preacher ain't supposed to use phrases like that. Uh, this preacher does because the audience I'm talking to is going to understand what I'm talking about. I get sick and tired of people online talking about how lonely they are. They're not lonely, they're horny! I used to have a best friend, Tommy. When Tommy and I met, I had a best friend. He's passed on since then, Jose. Man, I'm going to tell you, I didn't do anything by myself. I was single for a long time before I met Tommy. I didn't do nothing by myself. I didn't go anywhere by myself. Everything I did, I always did with Jose. My grandmother thought we were an item. I said, Grandma, he's my best friend. She said, oh, come on now. I said, Grandma, he's my best friend. I love him to death, but I'll tell you one thing. There ain't no way in the world I want to be romantically inclined with him, you know. I loved Jose, but there were things about Jose that, that I could put up with in a friend, but I wouldn't put up with in a partner. Do you know what I'm talking about? You ever known people like that? It's like, I can be your friend, fine. But honey, that's the best we'll ever be. 
Because you're way too selfish. You're way too self-serving. You're way too wanting a sugar daddy and I ain't interested in being nobody's sugar daddy. Hello now. I didn't do nothing by myself. I had a good friend that I loved. And you know what? I was never lonely. Now there were times I got horn doggled up. But I don't confuse being horn doggled up with being lonely. I'm going to tell you, some of you people out there complain about how lonely you are. If you'd ever learn how to make friends and keep friends, you wouldn't be so lonely. If you'd ever learn that every relationship you have doesn't have to end in the sack, you wouldn't be lonely. If you'd ever learn that there are better places to spend your time and to meet people who can be a positive influence on your life rather than the bar room and the nightclub. Oh, am I telling the truth today? Yes. I got a little church here. I'm going to tell you something. You make friends with any one of us, I guarantee you that we're going to add something good to your life. Am I telling the truth? We're going to be able to give you good counsel. We're going to be able to give you good advice. We're going to be able to help you make right decisions. We're going to be able to help you make good decisions. Because all we care about is your being successful and your accomplishing good things. And we're not looking to go to bed with you. Hello now. That's right. We're not waiting on you to buy another round for everybody. Oh, but why is this my time going to an affirming church when I can go to the bar on Sunday? I'll tell you why. Because all those times you gripe and groan about being lonely, you might find out you're not so lonely if you have real friends and real people in your life who really care about you and really want to see you succeed. But I watch some of these people singing their songs. You know, I look on YouTube. There's one family of apostolic folk who sing, you know, and on YouTube, all the long-haired girls and the short-haired fellows and everybody looks so perfect and so pristine. And you just know they ain't the one of them that has ever lived a minute of their life outside of the church. But they're standing there singing. Not the same. Not the same since Jesus found me. Not the same. Not the same since he turned my life around. Really? What do you know about it? What do you know about it? Well, the Bible said, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Former things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Really? So when you finally decided to live for the Lord on your own at the age of six, what did God do for you? Turn you into a drunken jackass because you're born and raised in church your whole life. So if everything was going to be new and everything was going to be changed, what other direction could he go in? Am I telling the truth? What do you know about it? You sing all these songs. You talk about these scriptures. But you haven't got a clue what you're talking about because you've never been there. You've never lived it. Got news for you. I know what I'm talking about. As a kid, Johnny, I was raised in the pew of a Pentecostal church and I was called to preach at the age of eight. Man, I thought I had a handle on everything related to the gospel and Christian living. I once told a man who had been converted and started coming to our church, and I told him rather proudly, I might add, I didn't need to understand his testimony. I didn't need to understand his background. I didn't need to understand how he had come out of drugs and how he had come out of illicit sexual affairs and how he had come out of all these negative, terrible things. Because after all, hallelujah, glory to God. God has been so good to me. He's kept me from ever being there. I'll never forget it. I literally said that to somebody. I was probably all of 15 when I said it. What an idiot. 
That man's name was Lenny. I'll never forget as long as I live. And he looked at me and he basically said to me, what do you know about it? So you don't know nothing. The older brother was at home. He had never been anywhere but at his father's house. He had never gone out and done the route of prostitutes. He'd never gone out and done the route of drunkenness. He'd never gone out and done the route of drug addiction. He had never been out in the world. He'd never been drunk. He'd never been the fool. He'd never been backslidden. He'd never been a sinner. What did he know about his brother's experience? He couldn't understand why daddy wanted to celebrate because the younger brother was home. Well, I don't get it. I've been here a long time. I've never done you dirty. I've never did to you what he did to you. Why are they singing? Well, the only time you're supposed to sing is when you're living right. The only time you're supposed to sing is when you've done everything right. The only time you're supposed to sing is when you've walked in victory your whole life. Uh, really? I'm going to tell you a little secret, honey. I backslid. I left God. I left the church for a few years when I first came out. I did a lot of stupid, sinful, ungodly, horrible, hideous, ridiculous things. I hurt a lot of people. And I'm going to tell you something. I, God is my witness. It haunts me when I think about some of the hateful, hurtful things I did to people. When I think about some of the things I said to people, Johnny, when I think about some of the, the way I used people, the way I did things, it haunts me. I say, God have mercy. I, I can't believe I was ever so foolish as to treat another human being the way I treated them. Amen to that. Then I watched Sister High Hair Holiness get up and sing about how her life has never been better and how it's not the same as it was when I was a sinner, when I did all these negative... Uh, excuse me. Sister, I hear holiness. Just what sin did you commit? Just what are you talking about? What isn't the same? What's changed? See, I know what it is to grow up in the church. I know what it is to, to walk around with that air of perfection. That mindset that you've got it all together because you've never been away from daddy's house. You've never done what these poor suckers have done. Oh, I'm going to tell you something, honey. When that little holiness apostolic group gets up on YouTube and starts singing, not the same, not the same since Jesus found me, not the same, not the same since he turned my life around, I hear them singing the words and I think, what do you know about it? But then as soon as I utter the phrase, what do you know about it? I get to thinking about what they're singing. I say, you know what? They don't understand what they're singing, but I do. <laughs> I'm not the same. Not the same since Jesus found me. I'm not the same. I'm not the same since he turned my life around. I get it. Hallelujah. Praise God. I understand it. Those words mean something to me that the people singing it don't even get. In my thinking years ago, my testimony was more powerful than his. After all, God had preserved me and kept me from all those sinful ungodly things. The prodigal son's older brother had sung all the songs and shared all the testimonies on Wednesday nights. But he had never been away from his father's house. When his brother returned, he was incensed at the celebration. He couldn't understand all the hoopla surrounding the return of his wayward brother. We often worry ourselves sick when a friend or a loved one backslides and finds their way into the world and into sin. 
I want to tell you something that I don't know a Pentecostal preacher on this planet that will ever say these words, but I'm going to tell it to you, and it's the truth. Backsliding can be the best thing ever happened to you. Mother with the backslidden son, Oh, glory. Mother with the backslidden son, the best thing ever happened to him is that backsliding. Wife with that backslidden husband, the best thing that ever happened to that husband was his backsliding. Oh, my goodness. Preacher, why are you insane? What were you smoking before church? Did you sniff something that didn't come out of a bottle that's supposed to help you breathe better? What, what, what's up with you? Something's wrong with you. I don't know a Pentecostal preacher on this planet who actually suggests that backsliding can serve a positive purpose. Why, the worst thing a Christian can do is backslide. Oh, ho, 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 you're so wrong. I'm going to tell you something. When a person backslides... And they find a way to God. And they get back to the Lord. And they come back into the fold of safety. And they find their way back to their father's house. Ain't nobody on this planet ever going to look at them and say, What do you know about it? Right. Because now they know. Hallelujah. It can have a powerful and constructive effect when somebody backslides. Don't despair. Look past today and see what God is able to do tomorrow. Amen. Experience is humanity's greatest teacher. And the lessons of experience are not easily forgotten. So sometimes the only way somebody going to learn, they got to hit bottom. So that they can understand. So when they sing the songs. And they come into Father's house. And they're singing all the celebratory songs. And they're dancing. Guess what honey. You're dancing and you're celebrating. But all of a sudden you got a whole new bounce in your step. All of a sudden you got a whole new lilt in your voice. Because you understand what you're singing. And you understand what you're shouting about. And you understand what you're dancing over. A whole lot differently than you did before you left daddy's house. Am I telling the truth? Yeah. Oh, I'm going to tell you, if you're backslidden away from God today, you have no idea how good it can be. <laughs> you have no idea. God has given you an opportunity to come back into the fold of safety. And honey, when you get here, you're going to find out your walk with God is so much better than it was before you left home. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm going to tell you, my walk with God is far better today than it was in 1989 when I came out and left the church and left God. For almost four years, I was the most miserable duck on the planet. I was so unhappy. I was. I love church. I love God's people. You know what? God's people don't have to be perfect. I know some of them, biggest hypocrites on the planet. Yep, I said it. And you know what? I'm able to love them anyway. You know why? Because I'm not a hypocrite. I love people to sit around judging the church. Well, I'm not going to go to that church. It's full of hypocrites. Well, honey, you're as big a hypocrite as they are because you talk about loving people in spite of themselves, but obviously you can't. So you're telling one thing and you're living something different. That's the very definition of a hypocrite. I can love the biggest hypocrite in the church. I don't have to like what they do. I don't have to like the way they do it. But I can love them. I can appreciate the fact that in their human imperfection, they're trying some way, somehow, to live for God. Got news for you. They and I are in the same boat. I'm imperfect too. I'm sinful too. I'm struggling too. I'm weak too. I've got faults too. I'm doing the best I can to live for the Lord with all the warts I've got. So I'm going to tell you a little secret. I'm about to sit in judgment of them. I'm not that stupid. I'm not that foolish just to sit in judgment of them. I understand 
that this thing is a battle for every one of us. And it's not a battle against someone. It is a battle within ourselves. Because the Word of God said that the flesh warreth with the Spirit. Our spirit wants to yield to God. Our spirit wants to surrender to the will of God and the leadership of the Holy Ghost. But then our body said, Oh, no, 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 we're going to do something different. I want to read to you a passage from Luke chapter 22, verses 31 through 34. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat Ooh, that means that the devil wanted to put Peter through an awful rough process but listen to what Jesus said in verse 32 but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not now listen to this. Talk about faith. And when thou art converted, <laughs> strengthen thy brethren. Lord, wait a minute. You just told me that the devil wants to put me through the ringer. He wants to sift me as wheat. Then you're telling me, don't worry about it because I prayed for you. Mother, oh hallelujah. <laughs> You got that backslid kid that you're worried about? <laughs> Don't worry about it. Jesus said, but I've prayed for you. But I've prayed for you. <laughs> you got a backslid kid? Oh, but I prayed for him. <laughs> Hallelujah. You got a backslid husband? Oh, but I've prayed for him. <laughs> Hallelujah. You got a backslid loved one? Oh, but I've prayed for you. You know somebody in the church that's backslid and lost their ground with God. But I've prayed for them. <laughs> Jesus spoke and said, but I have prayed for you as if that changed everything. The fact that they've got somebody praying for them changes everything. Amen. Mm -hmm. Oh, hallelujah. There's a lot of people out there backslid. A lot of people out there unsaved. A lot of people out there don't know God. And they don't have a soul in the world praying for them. But that person you're worried about, they got you. And I'm going to tell you a little secret. God answers prayer. The Lord said, but I've prayed for you. See, that changes everything, Simon. I've prayed for you. What have I asked for? That your faith fail not. See, I don't care what your actions do. I don't care what your mouth says. You can come out with some of the grossest, foulest, vulgarest, nastiest crap out of your mouth that any human being can speak. And that's all well and good. So long as your faith doesn't fail. I got a brother today who went through the Iraq War. And he came home and he's trying to live the atheist's life. My little baby brother, he used to have a heart that was so soft toward God. I'm going to tell you a little bit. I'm going to tell you Ooh, I'm going to tell you a little secret. I still think he's got a heart soft toward God. I still think that heart is in there. I don't care what comes out of his mouth. I don't care what he says. I don't care how he lives. I don't care what he does. I don't care what he speaks. My little brother got something that a lot of backslid boys ain't got. He's got a mother praying for him. He's got a brother praying for him. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Oh, but I've prayed for you. That changes everything. <laughs> Hallelujah. Mom, you can shout now. <laughs> that your faith fail not. And when thou art converted, meaning when you have returned, strengthen thy brethren. Use your experience to help others in the church. See, backsliding can be one of the best things that ever happened to you because it can equip you to help people that before you backslid, you could have never helped. Johnny, there are people that you can talk to in the LGBT community about living for God and about being a Christian today that 
30 years ago, you couldn't have talked to, you'd have nothing to say. Oh, but you've been down some roads that you weren't traveling back then. Yes. You've been some directions you didn't go back then. You've done some things you hadn't yet done. You said some things, uh, I mean, there were things you hadn't said yet that you since have said. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? Now you got a whole different arsenal of experience in your belt. Now you can help people who come into the church and say, I can't come back to God. I can't find my way back to God because I've done so many filthy, vile, nasty, terrible, hurtful things. Oh, honey, let me talk to you for a minute. Let me talk to you for a minute. Oh, hallelujah. I'm telling you, this message is exciting me. I don't know if it's exciting you, but it's exciting me. Amen. Let me talk to you for a minute. I guarantee you, you ain't been down a, a very many roads as dirty as the roads I've traveled. I guarantee you, you haven't done half the nasty things I did. I guarantee you that you didn't do people near as dirty as I did them. I still found my way back. And I ain't never been happier. Now when I sing songs like love lifted me. Oh, I'm going to tell you, I, we used to sing that song when I was a kid, and I hated the song. I thought it was the dullest, old, driest, baptisty sound in him I'd ever heard. Love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else would help, love lifted me. Oh, but you know what? I sing that song today. <laughs> it means something different to me today. Now I sing a love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Souls in danger. Look above. Jesus completely saved. He will lift you by His love out of the angry waves. Oh, hallelujah. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? Honey, the Betsy Kayando Boroshi Kayada Bahata Tandala Dabasita Yokoda Best thing ever happened to me was backsliding. Best thing that ever happened to me was falling out of church. Best thing that ever happened to me was walking away from my relationship with God for a period of time. Because when I got back to Daddy's house, everything tasted better. I understood things better. All of a sudden, there's a whole brand new depth of appreciation for everything in my father's house. For every blessing God has given me. Oh, I appreciate it so much better. You know what? I, 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 I'm not in a hurry to tell God to give me stuff that I may not be ready for anymore. Because I know, <laughs> I know that that can lead to a lot of trouble. No, now, I say, Lord, I sure wish, I sure wish. I'd like this. I wish this had happened. I'd like to see this. And when it don't happen, Johnny... Somehow or another, I, I've been down that road before, and I said, well, you know what? But he must have a reason. He must know what he's doing. I don't know what he's doing, but he must know what he's doing. And I'm just going to trust him. Apostle Paul said, I've learned to be content whatsoever state I am in. Doesn't matter if I'm hungry. Doesn't matter if I'm well fed. Doesn't matter if I'm single. Doesn't matter if I've got a partner. Doesn't matter what's going on in my life, whether I got a job, I hate, or a job that I love. Paul said, I've learned to be content. I can be happy wherever I'm at. I'm going to tell you something. Most people don't understand that passage until they've been backslid a while. You start living with the pigs and thinking their food looks good. And see how quickly you learn to be happy whatsoever state you're in. Hello now. Lastly, today, the Word of God promises, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. A lot of believers have children, loved ones who are backslid. 
and they cling to that promise. Just remember, that kid's got something that a lot of kids don't have. They got a praying mother. They got a praying grandmother. They got a praying aunt. They got a praying uncle. They got a praying brother. They got somebody praying for them. There's somebody begging God, Lord, whatever you do, don't let the foundation be destroyed. See, you can wipe the house, you can take everything above the foundation and destroy it. If, if the devil wants to destroy everything he is or everything she is, that's all the well and good. Just leave the foundation intact. You know why? As long as the foundation's there, we can rebuild. Hallelujah. Do you understand what I'm telling you now? As long as the foundation's there, we can rebuild. Believer, backslider, those of you today, oh, aren't you glad you didn't come to church to hear a message about the Messiah, Donald Trump? Hallelujah. Aren't you glad you come to church to hear about something good from God? Hallelujah. You backslid or you know somebody who's backslid, I'm here to tell you today, They've lived their life with people looking at them saying, what do you know about it? Calm down. You've prayed for them. Jesus spoke and said, I've prayed for you. That changes everything. You've prayed for them. That changes everything. Calm down. It's going to be okay. God's made a promise. Raise up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not part from it. Don't, don't sweat it. The promises of God are yea and amen in Christ Jesus. Isn't that what the Word of God says? Amen. The answer's on the way. This I know. Jesus said it, I believe it, and it's so. Quit praying and wondering if it's ever going to happen and start praying and looking for it to happen. Because prayer with expectation is the recipe for faith. And God responds, of faith. So singer, you get up and sing these wonderful lofty songs in the church about all the changes God's made in your life and all the wonderful things God's done for you since He brought you out of sin and yet you ain't never spent a day of your life in sin. What do you know about it? What do you know about it? I'm going to tell you something. I know a lot. But I had to go backwards to move forward. Yeah. I had to backslide to find my way back. Restoration is not always easy, but it's always... It's always a wonderful thing. There is nothing like a storm coming through and knocking down a house. And you see the destruction and you see, you know, the, the debris laying all about. And then you come back a year or two later and there's a brand new beautiful house sitting where the old house was. And you say, you know what, for everything that that property's been through, look what's there now. Yeah. Let me tell you, don't worry about what was, don't worry about what is, worry about what can be. Father's house is still Father's house. Amen. Daddy's waiting on the porch looking for you to come. Amen. Won't you come? Would you stand with me this afternoon?